We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata here. A few days have passed since the Bengals lost to the Patriots. Mike, how are you doing? I mean, I'm all right at this point. I feel like I feel like we've reached uh, we've reached the point where I, I, I'm definitely not upset about that loss anymore. I hope we have not reached the point that people don't want to listen to it at all because we're going to talk about it. Yeah, no, no, no. There's still plenty to go back and, and talk about with this game. And I think a lot of people, there's a lot of frustrations. There's a lot of, oh, they've been in this area before. They, they always bounce back. Why make it harder on yourselves when you don't have to do that? You open it at home. Joe Burrow gets a full training camp. And unfortunately, there were mistakes in this game, even though they played so ugly. And I would say that on both sides of the ball, they still had an opportunity to win this game several times and they just made mistakes. It could be the Charlie Jones fumble. It could be the Tanner Hudson fumble. Geno Stone had an interception in the end zone, wasn't able to hold on to that. There were just so many different things that you can look at on both sides of the ball and just say, hey, all three phases, they could have played better, even though it was ugly, still could have won the game. And unfortunately, this is one that we're going to look back on. Um, and, and I think it's easy to be a little frustrated on it. Obviously, as we get into Wednesday, team moves on. They're looking towards Kansas City. We'll get into all the Kansas City preview later in the week. But I got to start with number nine right now because, look, there's been plenty of times we've talked about it with Joe Burrow's slow starts. Oh, he's coming back from this injury or he had the appendix or it was the COVID year. It was his rookie year. This year, he's obviously still has the wrist that he's coming back from. And. I'm just looking at it overall, and I know it's so easy to point at Zach Taylor and be like, Zach Taylor needs to get these guys prepared. At the same time, slow starts might be a Joe Burrow thing right now. Yeah, because we have complaints about the play calling. I think there are valid complaints about the play calling. I don't think the play calling was a bigger issue than the quarterback in that game, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I Maybe it's about even, but... When I'm watching, I expected more out of Burrow. Just felt like the internal clock was fast. And this was a game that he was pretty well protected. We'll say chicken and the egg there. Like he was pretty well protected. But when you're looking at results-based protection, like pressures, whatever else, ball was also out really fast because the internal clock was fast. Mm -hmm. So was would it have been as good of a game if he was holding the ball for two and a half seconds when he went back there instead of two? I don't know, but overall, just felt like he saw pressure that wasn't there, just skittish, and I don't think this is a extremely long concern at the moment. If it's like that this week, and then especially, I think I feel like especially if he plays like that against Carolina or Washington, I have major concerns. Yeah. But at the moment, it does remind me of like 2022, where he started – had that internal clock sped up, was checking it down too much, um, just wasn't making the right plays. And you could see the old Burrow in those games. Think of the drive he put together to win that Pittsburgh game before mm -hmm. the craziness. Um, and then in this game, you could see he was putting it together third quarter mm -hmm. and maybe late in the late in the second too, because that's when the fumble happened. He's putting it together. He's, he's having some good drives and – then it went all away on that last drive. Just it felt like he didn't read anything correctly on that last drive, the last three plays. And well, I have faith that Burrow bounces back until I'm proven until proven. Otherwise, I think he bounces back. I think the Bengals will still be a good team. It's really frustrating to lose that game. They probably should have won even with mediocre quarterback play, mm -hmm. but uh, is what it is. We haven't really talked that much about what, I mean, what what you or I disliked about the play calling in specific. I feel like the quarterback has been a pretty big issue. Did, definitely wanted out there that I thought the quarterback didn't play good enough for what his contract is, for what he means to the team. But mm -hmm. do you have any other concerns about what happened with the play calling or anything? I think I think it's very easy and I, and it's really deja vu of what we hear in September for a lot of fans and, and when they mm -hmm. point at when the Bengals make it hard on themselves and they lose these first two games and hey look they might beat the Kansas City Chiefs I'm not ready to talk about that game yet but just overall the slow starts I think it, it's easy to point at Zach Taylor 
And then I think we forget in the middle of the season when it all starts to connect and the offense is rolling and they're one of the top offenses in the NFL and Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor are getting it done when it matters in those really important months when Joe Burrow is healthy. Um, they're winning these important games in October, November, December, and, and even into the playoffs. But you look at September and I think at times it's fair to look at Zach Taylor and be like, oh, you know what? The play calling wasn't ideal. But at the same time, I agree with you. I think this game was a little more on Joe Burrow than it was Zach Taylor. It's just easier to point at Zach Taylor, I think, for a lot of fans when it comes to play calling and kind of blaming a loss and the team yeah, not yeah. being prepared. And I think it was more of an execution versus – Versus the coaches, and, and maybe it's maybe it's just right down the middle. Maybe it's 50-50. Maybe it is the coaching and, and the play calling and the players, but Lou Anarumo wasn't missing tackles out there. Nope. Zach Taylor wasn't throwing the ball out there short of a first down several times, uh, which was really surprising for me out of Joe Burrow. He wasn't the wide receivers who couldn't get open, and some could say, well, maybe it's because Joe Burrow was getting the ball out so quickly and the wide receivers couldn't get separation, but the, the players didn't execute. And it really, I'm not going to lie, Mike, I was at the game. And obviously when you get into the stadium, it's exciting. It's loud. It really felt like everyone was sleepwalking. I was, I was, yeah. bored. I was bored watching that game and it is the home opener. Your quarterback's back out there. You get everybody dressing in orange. Um, obviously not the biggest thing, but at the same time, you drop a game at home where this team used to play really well at home. You can look at a couple games last year that they, that they lost. And it was really unfortunate the way they played. It just, I don't know. I look at this game and I think it was more on, on Joe Burrow. And, and of course you can say they should have been more prepared on, on both sides of the ball, but I don't know. It's just, it was really disappointing to be waiting for football that long and just to see what this team looked like when they were on the field. And like, don't get us wrong because I feel like we give Burrow all the credit in the world when he plays well and yeah. they win. Uh, so like, it's not like I blame or you blame Burrow very often, but the, I mm -hmm. think you also have to just be honest when you see this. Now, when it comes to the play calling, I had a few issues. The first okay. one was they, to their credit, knew that they could, and we're going to talk a lot about this in the next segment, they knew mm -hmm. they could get to that 12 personnel, Eric all drew sample stuff, because they tried it on the second drive, first play, and it completely whiffed. It, it didn't work. It went for one yard. I mean, that stinks. Then they don't, other than short yardage for just like pick up a first on third and one, which they did both times they tried that. Um, they didn't try that again until mid third quarter. That was to me just kind of frustrating of like, if Burrow threw a ball wide, you would still throw that pass just because a play doesn't work. Doesn't mean you throw it out. And then right after that play, to keep complaining about the, the second drive of the game, but mm -hmm. they went to a a run with no tight end attached. And like, that's fine. That's fine. They picked up, I think three mm -hmm. yards. That's fine on like second and two, first and 10 maybe, but on second and nine, it just felt like he was going down the first 15, the, the play, the schedule, the play script, the scripted plays and just calling the next one. And this has happened before early in the year, in my opinion. I think this has happened where it seemed like, oh, why why we run that? Like, it seemed like maybe you just thought the last play was going to be better. But making a run like that, what what's the ceiling on a run on an inside zone play with five offensive linemen, no tight end? Probably five yards. And five yards on second and nine, not that great. That's mm -hmm. fine to get the third and manageable, I guess. They didn't get much yards. And then they didn't convert on third down because – I mean, they had like, I think eight yards to go and they threw a pass to Gesicki that was at six yards. So I also thought there was too much quick game and the gotta have it plays were not, were not acceptable. I mean, one of them, apparently Joe Burrow switched into that flat screen. He has only ever, from what I've seen, used that against a cover zero look. And this was not a cover zero look. It was, it was a single high look. So it didn't work and credit to, I think it was Marcus Jones that sprinted down and made that tackle, but at no point did I think that was cover zero. So I didn't really understand throwing that. I think you should just have a better play for a fourth down situation like that. And I mentioned it last time, but the time Chase motioned across, just have a check, just have a check, man. You see man coverage, single high, have a check and be like, okay, Jamar, you're running down the field on this play. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's take a shot. The offense has been bottled up. We need to be able to take shots when we get them. And that was also my issue on the last play of the game for Burrow. It's like, 
this is your chance. It's a chance to get a shot in here. And he didn't even let it develop. That was the biggest issue on that play. It wasn't just they didn't throw it. It's that he didn't even wait. Like He didn't de- wait for that to develop whatsoever. By the time they were doing the out part of the out and up, his eyes went down and he turned into a runner. Yeah. I didn't understand that at all. Like what just shell shocked on that play. I don't know. I don't think it'll, I, I, again, we'll say, I don't think it's going to last <laughs> forever, but just frustrating to watch because I felt like they left stuff on the field. Um, it could have been a bigger day for chase. It could have been a bigger day for burrow easily could have won the game. But when I went back to watch, I did not see, did not see play calling as some disaster. I saw it more as like they didn't help him out that mm-hmm. much, but then he didn't help himself out either. Yeah, I agree. I feel like right down the middle. Um, and I'd probably put a little more in Joe's corner of, of you know, how that game turned out. But at the same time, you know, everybody has to be better. But just with the offense, one more thing I want to say before we move on to our next segment, um, because you have a really great piece over on all Bengals. But when you think of I, 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 this is not an excuse because this team played poorly and it was absolutely a terrible game. But I do think Jamar not getting those reps in training camp was still huge going into this game. I know Joe and Jamar are very familiar with each other, but it just didn't feel like you're not, you're not throwing the ball to him enough, enough for being the number one wide receiver on the field at the time. T. Higgins is not out there. So, you know, give the ball to Joe, to Jamar Chase, you know, like he used to say, F it, Jamar's down there somewhere. And it just wasn't that feeling, that confidence at all. They could have had one big play from Jamar to really just turn this game around and Jamar for six. And it just never felt like that. And and you got to use and utilize your best player out there. And and Jamar Chase, I just felt like, you know, hopefully Jamar's getting the full reps in practice this week. Um, Obviously a huge game versus Kansas City. But all of that stuff, I do think that stuff is important in training camp. Joe Burrow was working with T. Higgins most of the training camp the whole entire time. Um, and and T was having a fantastic training camp. So I do feel like that stuff is important. Hopefully everything is smooth sailing for now with Jamar Chase. It feels like the team's going to hold off on the contract extension until after the season's over, which is fine. That happens all the time, but it's just unfortunate kind of how this whole training camp went down when it comes to him getting reps. And I, I do think that even though he is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, that stuff does matter. Yeah, and it would have been nice to have him on the extra snaps because I know he missed a couple of snaps because he's on a little bit of a count. Uh, would have been nice to have the timing. Um, yeah, just felt like they weren't on the same page at all times. Mm-hmm. It was frustrating, just frustrating in general. Uh, I agree with that. I <laughs> The one part of the CeeDee Lamb thing where he said he would have sat out, I don't know. Like You're going to have to sit out two years. I don't know. It. It's different. I, 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 the thing is, you asked us a couple months ago not to do, get too sidetracked on the contract extension. But if you were to ask me two months prior, I would have said they're waiting until the season's over to get the contract. And that's fine because Jamar has two years left. I think a lot of people forget with CD and Justin Jefferson. These are different. They are, they didn't have two years left. You know, yeah, they're the getting paid. Year. It just it's, it's one of those things where I don't think people understand. So Look, it might have been a year's thing with the Cincinnati Bengals, and they wanted him longer, and Jamar's like, hey, I want to double dip and get another payday. I do not blame both sides for that, but it's just really unfortunate that they couldn't get it done. But I agree with you. Sitting out, that's not going to help. That's not going to help Jamar. And the same thing, I want to say one more thing, um, just when it comes to wide receivers and T. Higgins, he's dealing with a hamstring injury. It's going to be really important for T. Higgins to get back out there. Um, that hamstring injury is something that's lingered, you know, during his time in Cincinnati and, you know, hopefully he can get healthy and get back out there because T is playing for that bag. And I do think it's important that he's on the field in 2024 to show like, I am one of the top wide receivers in the NFL and I can be healthy, um, for other NFL teams. So, you know, hopefully T's back out there soon, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's crazy to hear. I mean, I know there were reports that the team tried to get it done on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, they were going to get it done. Could you imagine announcing that before the game? That would have been insane, but unfortunately it didn't happen. And it just feels like, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things that overall the last 40, 72 hours for the Cincinnati Bengals has been a huge downer. And, and hopefully this is just the deja vu of what we've seen before when it comes to slow starts, but Joe Burrow has to play better and we don't criticize him a lot because he's one of the top NFL quarterbacks and he doesn't have a lot 
we really have to criticize because he always bounces back and shows that, hey, I got this under control. But you hope to see that sooner than later for Joe and this offense. And I could say the same thing for play calling and, and the offensive staff, too. Yeah. Um, one last thing just before we hit the next segment is <laughs> – the idea that T Higgins went out there and played in a preseason game, but he's sitting out because of his contract um, in regular season games is insane. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if he skipped camp, skipped the preseason, basically, you know, did what Jamar did and then came in that last week of practice and then pulled the hammy. Yeah, I'd buy it, but I'm not buying it when he was there at every step of the off season program. No. And I know he requested the trade, but then it didn't happen. He played in a preseason game and he scored a touchdown in a preseason game. He probably didn't have to be out there. He could have no. said he had something he was dealing with, said he was sick, whatever. Uh, so that's the last thing I want to put on that was just I find that part so ridiculous with what's going on. Yeah, and, and hopefully we get a good update. Um, you know, I know Adam Schefter spoke earlier this week on Pat McAfee and said it doesn't look like that T will go for Kansas City, but hopefully we get a good update and T is back in the swing of things because like we like we both said, I mean, it's extremely important for T to be out there. Um, he's going to want to showcase to other NFL teams. Like, look at me. I am one of the top wide receivers. Um, so we'll see what that looks like, but hopefully he gets out sooner than later. And if not, this team has to come up with some other plans when it when we think about the wide receiver depth, because obviously that was an issue on Sunday. But I want to go to other things. I feel like this is more of a positive spin on what Mike has pointed out in Sunday's game with this offense next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. More with this offensive side of the ball. You have a great piece over on all Bengals and something that, look, I feel like we are Drew Sample fan club over here. I was pumped about the extension. I loved everything about it. I feel like that's underrated extension the Cincinnati Bengals were able to do in the offseason. Eric All, the hype is real. Lewis Reddick has been one of the top dogs who really believed if, if Eric All can stay healthy, and, and look, I, I know a lot of people, they freak out when I say this, but he can be kind of a George Kettle type of tight end for the Cincinnati Bengals and be a reliable guy. Maybe it's not in his rookie year. Maybe it's more in year two of what he looks like as a tight end on the Bengals offense. But let's just talk about the two of them when you think about the Cincinnati Bengals offense and, and what they can do and kind of turn it around in a positive way and some other opportunities for them in the offense. So flat out. To me, it was their best personnel grouping, just having those two on the field and two wide receivers and one running back. Um, specifically, Zach Moss, I'm just going to, I guess, push this take out and keep moving. I thought Zach Moss looked better than Chase Brown. I just thought he read the field better. He read his blocks better. When Chase Brown ran into his own guy, and granted, it was a really nice play from the defender, but you're, you're moving too fast. You're moving too fast. He still seems like a little bit of a designed runner. Anyway, so when you look at, what the Bengals offense did this, they were really good in the run game. I mean, you're talking about stuff. Everything was in the 90 plus percentile, actually 93rd plus percentile. We're talking about their success rate, their expected points added per play, how often they picked up a first down. And then it was even better when you talk about what they did with the, this personnel grouping instead of 54% success rate, which is in the top 93% of, you know, games that have ever happened since at least 2001, it was 85.7 and they averaged 5.43 yards per carry in despite two of those plays being a third and one short yardage situation. And it's where they're only touched on the game. And I want to con contextualize the run game stats in general too. outside of this personnel grouping, the run game wasn't good. It was only successful one out of the six plays that they ran. Uh, that they ran the ball. They didn't pick up a single first down and it was generally, it was generally bad. <laughs> it, was, it was because that's what I remembered from the game. So when I first looked at the base stats, I was like, wow, the run game was really good. But what I remember feeling early on was like, ah, they're running the ball and it's not working. They're running the ball. It's not working. It was really when Eric all came in in the mid third quarter that the run game just exploded, took off. So I, when you talk about that having that good of a run game, I think that's I think it's gonna be necessary at least until T. Higgins comes back. But I'd probably keep doing it after, because you're gonna really put the defense into a bind. Um, I don't think that they need to spread the field out and try to have Joe Burrow play point guard when his outside of Jamar Chase's receiving options aren't superstars. They're like fine role players. I think all of them are fine role players, but nobody is a superstar that's going out there. Um, 
I don't know. I, I thought Eric All and Drew Sample, there was a lot to like in terms of the run game. Obviously, I've been talking about that. But I think there's untapped potential in the pass game. They were still getting those soft, too high looks. That is why, well, at least that is half the reason why this run game was so good. They're just punishing the defense for playing soft. They were in nickel. They weren't matching it with their base defense. And they were still playing too high, deep out, deep out there too high. Not too high where the safeties are going to come and play run support. They're playing too high where the safeties are just completely out of this fit. They're, they're playing the pass. So if that's how teams are going to play you, run the ball. That's the easiest answer. And I felt like game plan wise, their answer was short, that was quick game because they were expecting that and it didn't work for multiple reasons. Why did it take so long to get to the run game? Because the run game was working. The run game was cooking. The run game was great. And I don't think RPOs should be involved. I think this should just be straight runs, straight run game stuff here. I don't even think it matters if they go under center pistol shotgun. I think pistol would be the best for what they do, but yeah, I, whew, I really love this unit when they were out there and it was, it was this 12 personnel unit. I think it's something that they could bank on, for the future, why have three wide receivers and then a tight end who's also a receiver out there when you could kind of diversify the field out there and have Jamar Chase, who's awesome, another receiver, whether that's Yossi Vash, maybe Burton has a couple runs, and maybe it's Irwin, maybe it's whoever before Higgins gets back. You could even make Gasicki and make it a weird 13 personnel if you wanted to. Um, but while while they're struggling on offense, I think this is the easy button that they might need. Yeah, and, and it kind of felt like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it kind of felt like at one point, obviously that was working and they figured out it was working, but they also kind of treated the game like they were down by 25 points and they were like, the okay, next, the, the <laughs> next drive after, yeah, they, they didn't get to it. They're, it was like this end of the third, start of the fourth, and yeah, they're treating it like they're down multiple scores when they just need a score to take the lead. Yeah, it was really strange. And and obviously it's the first game and, and you see how it looks out there. And you mentioned with Eric Gall, and obviously I, I love that. I love that they're utilizing him already in the first game. And it's awesome that he's healthy and he's out there. Do you see him in the passing game as more of a could have the potential towards the end of the season to be a tight end one-ish type of player? Or is he kind of your, your tight end two, tight end three? He's a big ball of clay right now for me because I don't even think he's a great run blocker at the moment. I think he's a solid run blocker. I, he got a bad PFF grade, but it's but it's he only had seven reps run blocking. They gave him like a 43 or something, which is bad. Um, contextualizing that, it was because he whiffed twice, and one of those plays mattered. The other one, he did his job still. Like he whiffed, but the defender had to – Miss, make that block miss by going outside and underneath the block. So he took himself out of the play. The defender couldn't make a play on that anyway. I mean, look, when 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 Hayden Hurst and Irv Smith are making those blocks, and that was that was that was a pretty good, that was a pretty good ending for them to just at least get in that guy's way. And then he also hit it once where he hit that guy square and jolted him. And then they probably didn't give him pluses for that block where he jolted him. Probably didn't give him pluses when he does a fine job blocking a linebacker or driving the safety. So that's why the PFF grade is what it is. It's also a small sample size. Mm -hmm. I think he looked like a solid blocker. That's a little bit out of control at times, but I think it's going to get better the more reps he gets. I think we are talking about him being a tight end one end of the season. We'll see. I, yeah. I didn't see him on enough passing plays. The One of the passing plays he was on the field for, he blocked. So, <laughs> yeah, so he had one route that I considered like a real route. He didn't get open, but I'm not going to hold that. Like he'll never become a guy. It was one route. Who cares? Uh, so I still think you could manufacture things for him right now. I think he has mm -hmm. some high end athleticism. I think if you trust him to catch the ball, like he'll probably be able to get you an explosive in the next, in the couple of coming weeks. Cause I just think if they run that play where he does that motion, you know, just jibbity, 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 and then supposed to crack that end and kick them out. If if you run that two, three times in a game, and then you're going to do it again, I mean, what's that linebacker end going to do? He's going to prepare to get smacked, and then you just run past them. And that should be wide open. That should be wide open. What, wh however you want to scheme that up, whether you want that to be like some type of screen play or what I think is just throw it out there as like a flat concept. could even be a wheel, or it could be something in the – that nature, I don't know, but I think that is there for them. I also think there's untapped ISO potential. Like if he leads up 
into the linebacker, like through the line. I think that'd be interesting because what can you do off of that? I've seen some fun stuff that some teams have done uh, when their second tight end or fullback or whatever looks like he's going to ISO block a linebacker that runs right by him. Sometimes those are explosive plays and those don't require you to be some nuanced route runner. Those are just schemed up. That's a lot of, a lot of tight ends just get schemed up stuff, but that's what I'd look for. I, I'd try to get some of those before I think he's like the dude at tight end. And I don't think, I don't think it's a, like a sample or all situation. I think it's an, and I think sample and all at the moment, like that's what we should be doing. And then Gasicki's still there for passing downs because, you know, he makes great contested catches, almost came down with one. Um, I don't consider that a drop either. Like, <laughs> that was oh, such a hard man. play to make. But, uh, yeah, I, I think Gasicki still has his role. They don't know what the Tanner's role is. Maybe they still want to run them out there on third down. I don't get it. Um, but uh, I, would be, I would be using those three tight ends pretty much exclusively. If you have an injury to Gasicki, I get one of the Tanners taking that spot. Yeah. But – before that, I don't, I don't really. I think he's not playing hundred percent of snaps, so I don't think he needs that many breaks. No, and that ball from Joe was, was absolutely. Great. It was, it's right. It was sitting right in front of me, and Gasecki. Joe throws it to him. He find he sees him open in the end. Gasecki turns around just in time to put his hands up, and then obviously didn't have full control over it. And it was a red call, but it's just so unfortunate because it looked beautiful from Joe to Gasecki. It just. And just wasn't a catch. It's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, no, I'm excited to see what what they're able to use with those and, and some of the new pieces. I mean, goodness, you put you said sample and all Gasecki, he's not out there 100 percent of the time. If T. Higgins is not going to be available for who knows, you never know with a hamstring, it could linger. There's other possibilities with this offense. And I think that's the biggest thing. You can't just be like, oh. Well, if Jamar's not open, we're stuck. There's nowhere else to go. You have to be creative. And and that's going to be a question, you know, will Jermaine Burton be a part of this offense sooner than later, even though there is some kind of I don't I don't even know what it is. I don't even know what it is. He's just not out there a lot yet. So maybe they'll slowly start to put him in with this offense. Yeah, I love Jermaine Burton as a prospect on film. And I mean, I thought what he did in the preseason was good. I just also read the I read the room and I'm just it's not me being anti Jermaine Burton. It's me seeing what the Bengals have done so far. And it's like, I'll see it when I, I'll believe it when I see it type of thing with him in terms of seeing the field. I think he's a good player. Whenever they trust that he can go out there and, you know, he earns the quarterback's trust, earns the coaching staff's trust as putting in the work. I think he'll be good, but I don't think that's like, I don't talk about that being the secret to the Bengals winning without T Higgins, because I just don't think the staff is going to do that. I think there's a non-zero chance the staff looks at this run game personnel and thinks like, Hey, we could lean on this a little bit. Why not um, in Kansas city? Yeah. Yeah. Lean on in Kansas city. At least try it. Just try it. And I think they will. I think they'll try it. And I hope if it doesn't work the first or second play, they don't just throw it out the window and go back to what they were doing before. I think give it three, four attempts, maybe not all in a row because you don't want to go three and out, although they did four times in the game against New England. Um, it's so frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Then, man, but like there are opportunities in all this to be able to just pick up a first down. That first first down, I always hear Peyton Manning talk about that's the hardest one to get once you get that first one, you get into a rhythm, and that's uh, frustrating. But anyway, 12 personnel. I think the pistol – but they, they they seem to never want to major. In, they always throw it out there like a little tease, three plays a year, and they did three plays in that game. I think they could lean on it from the pistol looks. I think it would be pretty good from shotgun, and they could even put Joe Burrow under center. The run game would probably be best if Joe Burrow's under center. I just it doesn't seem like what he's most comfortable with, so I'm trying yeah. to find the happy medium. And the happy medium to me is that pistol stuff because I think he could still keep his eyes to the defense a little bit. Um that is probably an issue for young quarterbacks that don't go under center very often. It's actually fun watching Peyton Manning yesterday. He talked about one of Aaron Rodgers' secrets when he goes under center is get the ball, look at the defense, and then turn around, fake the handoff, and then look back so you're not as confused as you'd be if you just caught that ball, turn right around, and fake the handoff. Um, I don't know. But I guess then you probably also want to do that on your normal <laughs> handoffs too, look at the defense, mm-hmm. then go. So 
I'm not a quarterback expert, but I thought that was interesting and maybe something, maybe Burrow just, you know, like I, cause I haven't seen him do that. So maybe pick that up if you ever have to run an under center play action, which they did a couple times and New England had no respect for it. They didn't respect no. it at all. So they got to run the ball out of that look too. Yeah. Like, I, I just feel like, yeah, you've got to, you've got to be a threat somehow uh, when you are doing it. So we'll see what it looks like. Um, I, I don't try to look too much into week two and what it's going to look like for the Bengals just because I've, I've noticed the last trending five to six years of what it has looked like. So we'll get into that preview later. Uh, I do want to get a quick hit on the defensive side of the ball really quickly. Missed tackles, an issue for the Cincinnati Bengals. No real surprise. I mean, we said it in the preview. We said it after the game. The Patriots can't control this game. They could run the ball. And, and that's exactly what they were able to do. Nothing against Jacoby Brissett. He made plays when he needed to, but look, they could run the ball. So if I'm the Patriots, I'm going to continue to run the ball. And unfortunately, 13 missed tackles is absolutely brutal for this team. 14 is their high, and that was last year versus the Titans, and that was a brutal game. How do you fix the issue on the defense side of the ball? Tackle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, but but everybody wants to point out like well maybe it's they need to be hitting in preseason or maybe they need to be hitting maybe oh yeah yeah like, i mean i think a more intense preseason would help a yeah. more intense training camp i also think i guess i was talking to uh, one of the reporters that was there they said it was more intense this year i don't know what that means because i feel like it's been pretty lax the past couple of years does that just mean yeah. like it was like you know, a little more intense or is it up there with like, you hear about the chiefs ones are brutal. It's not like the chiefs start flame and hot every year, but I also think they look decent to start the year. Usually uh, and they looked good enough against the Ravens. I didn't think they looked bad. I didn't think they looked too rusty. Uh, yeah. I guess just hit more in those games. Maybe to me, an NFL player, they know how to tackle. I don't think this is a – to me, it's not a coaching thing at that point. And maybe I'm wrong. I did not play in the NFL. I just think these guys have been coached from Pop Warner to high Third school grade. at least, third grade, high school, college. That they, they know the fundamentals of tackling. I think it's just, you know, got to get in there and get dirty and do it. I don't – and the angles are off sometimes. So, like – you could say the coaching staff needs to work on that with them, but I also think like the players just need to make the tackles. I feel this way about offensive line play too. Sometimes it's like that guy didn't forget how to block. That guy didn't forget how to tackle. He just needs to make the tackle. Just go make the play. There's only so much you can blame on the coaching staff. Cause I thought Lou was cooking. I thought he was cooking. I thought he called some good blitzes. I thought he called some good stunts. He did enough to stop the run game. When you have 118 out of 120 yards coming after contact, was that 99% of his yards came after contact? They were there. Mm -hmm. They were there to make the plays. They just didn't finish the tackle. And credit to Ramondre. He's always going to get some yards after contact. Like, he is a very good runner. But not that. That's rare. 13 missed yeah. tackles, that's rare. Those are those are the back end of some uh, statistics you don't want to be a part of, whether a guy is a good running back or not. So I think – and they've tackled good running backs before. I think guys were – they had issues doing it. I thought almost every member of the secondary. I think Mike Hilton and Von Bell were the two guys that if you looked at them, you're like, yeah, I didn't think they missed any tackles. Everybody else, especially Dex Hill, sadly, yeah. was missing a lot of tackles, just not making the right tackles. It it stinks. And the linebacker, Pratt missed some. Uh, so yeah. I don't think Wilson missed any. I don't think Wilson, Wilson missed any, if I recall correctly. Yeah, good game. Yeah, I thought he had a pretty. I thought he had a pretty good game. Okay, so game, yeah. I, when I good, sure. I don't know. <laughs> back, yeah. back seven, back seven. When I say in the back seven, I think Wilson is excluded. Needed work. Needed work in that game. I didn't think there were like huge communication issues. If that like from the safeties, but I also didn't think they got tested. Like that passing offense wasn't there to test you. And that's also we can get to it. But I think I've seen a lot of people disappointed in a lot of these pass rushers. And my opinion of that was, I mean, they weren't really throwing the ball very much. And when they were, it was pretty – they were – Hendrickson got pressure. He got seven pressures yeah, and they man. didn't throw the ball very often. And I wouldn't – I would not put all those guys right into the trash bin. I think the guys that got the 0% pressure rates, that's frustrating. Sam Hubbard? Yeah. $10 zero, million dollars this year? 0%. 
pass rush win rate. When I saw that, and and to be honest, he wasn't the best run defender in this game. So I, ugh. if Murphy was healthy, I think there'd be a discussion. But until be. until he is, they don't seem to trust Osai enough because Osai's out there in the rundowns, but then not rushing the. He's not there on third down. I'm so confused on that part too, but. Maybe it's something they know that I don't know. But to me, Osai's got juice as a pass rusher. We've seen it. We've seen it. And he's not – those skills shouldn't be gone completely. They look pretty good in the preseason. So get him out there, at least no, in the I, pass rush scenario. I agree with you. I think when Murphy's back – and obviously the team is being extra cautious. Maybe he would have been you know, able to come back week three or even to the week four game. But to get those four games, to get fully healthy or at least be good to go, I think it is smart with Miles Murphy. But – you, you might have to have a discussion, you know, I, I know how much, you know, not to get too much into the contract money and all of that stuff, but, but if Sam Hubbard's not producing, put the guy out there, put your first round pick out there from, from a year ago and, and see what he's able to do because the production should be there. Um, but yeah, you know what, Mike, I, I agree with you with the missed tackles and maybe we look back at the defense and look, they have a huge test coming up with the Kansas city chiefs and, and Pacheco and their new weapons and what that looks like. And obviously Patrick Mahomes, but not to look too far into that with this team alone on the defensive side of the ball, if you made the tackles and they weren't put in some of the situations, they were, if they made if, half the tackles. Yeah, half the tackles. And and Charlie Jones probably doesn't fumble the ball. You know, they're not not sitting in that area. Geno Stone catches the ball in the end zone and they don't get the field goal, you know. That was a tough one. That was a tough that, one. That too. was that, that, I should That's like a sicky. That's like a sicky. I've seen people get on stone about it. I'm like, it's a contested catch. Like yeah, he's fighting a tight end for the ball. I, I'm not it's not like the ball hit him in the chest. It's not it's not the Daxil where it hit him in the hands and then fell to the receiver for a <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> My goodness. But but also kind of just to go back to the defensive side of the ball, the offense should have been able to produce the Cincinnati Bengals offense. They should have been able to pr produce to put them in, you know, a better situation. And they just never did. And and honestly, it felt like they did towards, well, honestly, coming out of the locker room, the Patriots got the ball, the defense was able to stop them. And then there's a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. and it just puts them in a, a bad spot. So I really, I, I agree with you. I think you, you Maybe, like you said, half the tackling, you're able to do that. You make the adjustments and and you feel a little bit better about the defensive side of the ball because, you know, you hear all training camp. And I know we shouldn't look into training camp or anything like that, even preseason. But you're like, oh, man, these guys are you're, they're really cooking out here in practice. We'll see what it looks like. And Chris Jenkins could be returning soon. I know he had surgery on Friday to be determined if he's good to go for week two. But, you know, you you want to see something out of that game. And, and hopefully it is. The defense can just – fix some of the mistakes when it comes to missed tackles. Um, offense, I just, I don't know, I guess I got to see another game right now, <laughs> really, to to see the offensive side of the ball. But it's really just the same thing we've we've watched for the last two to three years. Yeah, NFL's, NFL's funny because the healthiest the team is going to be is week one. Everybody's dealing with something by week 12. It's also the sloppiest the team is going to be is week one, especially the Bengals. So, um I haven't put it past that there's a way to get around this. I mean, the Patriots look pretty sharp. I thought I thought their defense specifically. I mean, they're. I don't think they missed any tackles. They made every tackle. So and their whatever they're doing is good. I, I want to oh, say yeah. like, their defense oh, yeah. is good, and I think we shouldn't overlook that. Not not to say like, oh yeah, the Patriots. No, their defense was a pretty solid group. You know, last smart year unit, before. fundamental unit. Maybe don't have as many superstars as you want. Although I think Christian Gonzalez is a very good player. I think Kyle Duggar is a good player, um, which we saw, we saw uh, on those back-to-back -back plays. I don't think that, you know, Keon White, maybe this is a breakout for him with the two and a half sacks also felt like, Oh boy. <laughs> you know, so we might have some, we might have an issue at right tackle, uh, but Uche, he's a good passer. Like they've got pieces that are good role players and they have some budding stars. They lost Judon, yeah. Barmore's not playing, yeah. But it's still a very fundamental unit. It's a very sound unit. It's a unit that can deceive the quarterback. It, you know, every piece of that secondary, I believe, has been there outside of Gonzalez for the past three years. Yeah. So when you have that, you remember what the Bengals used to be able to do when that was what their secondary looked like. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's an underrated defense. I I don't think I would be surprised if I looked up in whatever metric you want to use, EPA, DVOA, or just straight points. I don't think I would be surprised I look up in the Patriots for like a top eight 
defense. Yeah. I think that's just – everybody focuses so much on offense, talk about the, how the Patriots can get the number one pick. And, like, yeah, the offense kind of stinks. They only scored 16 in this game. It's not like the offense really went out there. And I know the knee-jerk reaction was to blame Lou a little bit. Uh, I think we're past that. But the offense yeah. wasn't the reason – the Patriots' offense wasn't the reason they won that game. It was very – sound fundamental defense that won them that game and credit to them i thought when you come out and you're the sharp team you're not the sloppy team you have a chance to win any of these games and they did yeah and uh we'll have plenty more obviously we're recording this on a tuesday night when we record on thursday we'll have the latest from the cincinnati Bengals practice is t higgins back out there is amarius mims back out there chris jenkins could we see any of those players who were hurt in week one back for week two and i think all eyes are going to be on practice as this team has a huge one already coming up with the kansas city chiefs at arrowhead uh, Mike, as I mentioned before, has a great piece over on All Bengals. Make sure you check it out. Also, all of his breakdowns, amazing during football season. Go see all of his clips over on Twitter, Bengals underscore Sands. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. We'll be back later this week on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati.